Boy in the Alamo, Chapter 11, All is Lost. I could not bear to look at the dead man. It made my stomach feel all gone. We are the Texian army, Lupe said. He's the Mexican army. Although I knew it was wrong, I was glad she was there. I didn't want to be alone with the man who had been running a minute before and now would never run again. It was not the time to wonder about wars or why men shoot each other, but I wondered. He had once been a boy like me. In a little while, Captain Dickinson stumbled across the chapel floor toward us. He was covered with dirt and powder burns, and he had lost his cap and his hair hung down in his eyes. Stand inside the door, he panted. No one knows you're here yet. His face looked wild and woebegone. Lupe and I moved back, and Captain Dickinson vaulted the barricade to the inner room and took Mrs. Dickinson in his arms. How's it going? She asked. Heaven help us, Sue. The Mexicans are in the fort. If you live, take care of our child. Travis is down with a ball in the head, but he drew his sword and killed a Mexican as he fell. Is there any hope, Alamaran? Mrs. Dickinson asked him. I'm afraid not, he said. We are outnumbered, 100 to 1. God bless you, my darling. Farewell. Mrs. Dickinson was crying. I pray for your safety, she wept. We will meet again, somewhere, somehow. Without looking back, Captain Dickinson jumped over the barricade and ran toward the inner court where the sound of the battle was at its height. Lupe and I crouched inside the door. I had cocked the pistol and I held the dirk. In a few moments, we saw a lone Mexican soldier walking toward our door like a cat. He was looking all around on our end of the chapel and listening with his head on one side. I put my finger on my lips to tell Lupe to be quiet and I tiptoed to the barricade. Don't make a sound, I whispered to the sobbing women. Don't let the baby cry. One of them is over there. They muffled their sobs. Lupe and I crouched in the shadows. As the man got nearer the door, couldn't stand it no longer, I rose up like a hinge being sprung, and Lupe rose beside me. He was almost on us when Lupe, pushed beyond her strength, shrieked, Vamos! Vamos! We caught him by surprise. He straightened up and looked at us. If you come one step nearer, I will shoot you like a dog, I shouted, brandishing the gun. He continued to advance. The light glanced off his bayonet. Lupe translated this into Spanish in a shrill shriek. Here, I said to Lupe, and I handed her the dirk. Fight him if you have to. Lupe grasped the knife like a dagger. The Mexican threw back his head and laughed. Muchachos! He roared, No tengo tiempo para muchachos. He says he has no time for children, Lupe said. He laughed some more, wiped his face with his bandana, and turned to go. I let fly the hammer of the pistol, but it did not go off. It was empty. All this time I had a gun, but I had no bullets. But the Mexican had gone toward the inner court, and we were saved for the moment. Was he afraid of us? Lupe asked. Coward! It was then that I saw Buck. He was staggering toward us, holding his side. His face was so white that the freckles stood out on it like fly specks, and it was streaked with dirt and blood and what looked like tears. And his eyes were red, his lips were parched and chapped, and he had a wild, sad look about him. Buck, are you hurt? I screamed and ran toward him. The battle is going against us, Will, he said. If we don't come through, you must make your way back home. Do you understand me? Yes, Buck. 
You made a good try, he said, swaying, and he patted my arm. Now stand guard over here. I want to speak to Mrs. Dickinson. He went into the room and dragged himself over my barricade. I heard him asking for water. I stood holding my empty pistol, and Lupe put the dirk back in my hand. You keep it, she said. I felt very tired. Buck did not look right to me. He had been holding his side in a funny way. I was terribly lonesome then. I didn't know what was the matter with me, but I wanted to lie down on the dirt floor and ball and ball. Mrs. Dickinson had climbed over the barricade and came and stood beside Lupe and me. She put her hand on my head as if I were a child, and I saw the tears were running down her face. I need water very badly, she said. Our canteen has run dry. Before I could run toward the well in the inner court, the barricade before the doors of the chapel was broken down and the Mexican soldiers swarmed into the main room in a howl, in a howling mob. They were like wild animals shouting and hissing above the sound of the deguelo, which never stopped its terrible wailing. We flattened ourselves against the wall and they rushed by us like a herd of stampeding cattle into the baptistry of the chapel where Colonel Bowie, who was choking with pneumonia, had been brought for safekeeping. I saw him lying there on his cot, flat on his back, face red with the fever, brandishing a pistol. Ham, his body servant, was crouched at the foot of his cot, mumbling prayers. Colonel Bowie shot the first two Mexicans that came toward him, and I saw them fall. Don't look, Mrs. Dickinson cried and turned Lupe and me to the wall and stood between us and the door with her arms out and her skirt spread to hide the sight of the Mexicans with their drawn bayonets descending on the helpless man. Angelina began to shriek in the inner room and Mrs. Dickinson said, Promise me you won't go out the door. I must look after the baby. Stay right here until I come back. I crept to the door. Lupe followed me across the chapel. We saw them coming, the officer in gold braid and shining boots. There was nothing for it but to make a stand. I spread my feet in the door, holding the empty pistol in one hand and my dirk knife in the other. Halt! I shouted when he was 20 feet away. If you come one step nearer, I will fill you full of holes. He stopped short and looked at us. And then he drew his sword. I could almost feel the cold blade against my throat, but I stood my ground. Then he took a white silk handkerchief out of his pocket and tied it to the sword blade, which he held in front of him. He made me a military bow. I recognized the handkerchief as a flag of truce. Advance, I said, my teeth chattering against each other. I was shaking all over as if I had a chill from the malaria. What would happen to my brother Buck now? I present the compliments of General Santa Anna, the man said in English. Will Campbell at your service, I said. Colonel Crockett's Tennessee Volunteers. He smiled. I am Colonel Alamonte, he said. What have you here? He touched Lupe's curls. Women and children only, I lied. I didn't want him to know Buck was in. This is Guadalupe, daughter of Captain Mendoza. Texian, Lupe spat out. Senorita, the officer bowed to her. I could wish you were on my side. Lupe glared at him, but I am not, she said. Shall we lay down our arms, he asked, and he took off the white flag and put his sword back in its scabbard, and I put the dirk in my belt and laid the empty pistol on the floor. General Santa Ana has instructed me to offer you safe conduct to San Antonio de Bayar, he said. The Alamo has fallen. So we had lost the battle. Are we to be with the prisoners? I asked, thinking of Buck. There are no prisoners, Colonel Almonte said. A chill ran down my spine. 